Chapter 9 That evening, Nathaniel set off for home in a mood of black despondency. The day had not gone well. A barrage of messages throughout the afternoon had proclaimed the agitation of the senior ministers. What was the latest on the Piccadilly outrage? Had any suspects been arrested? Was a curfew to be enforced on this, a day of national rejoicing? Who exactly was in charge of the investigation? When were the police to be given more powers to deal with the traitors in our midst? While he toiled, Nathaniel had sensed the side glances of his colleagues and the sniggering of Jenkins behind his back. He trusted none of them. All were eager to see him fail. Isolated, without allies, he didn't even have a servant he could rely on. The two foliots, for instance, had been useless. He had dismissed them for good that afternoon, too dispirited even to give them the stippling they deserved. What I need, he thought, as he departed his office without a backward glance, is a proper servant. Something with power. Something I know will obey me. Something like Talos Nemedes or my master Schubert. But this was easier said than done. All magicians required one or more demonic entities as their personal slaves, and the nature of these slaves was a sure indicator of status. Great magicians, such as Jessica Whitwell, commanded the services of potent Jean, which they summoned fast as a finger snap. The Prime Minister himself was served by no less than a blue-green afrit, although the word bonds necessary to snare it had been wrought by several of his aides. For everyday affairs, most magicians made use of foliates, or imps of greater or lesser power, who generally attended their masters on the second plane. Nathaniel had long been eager to employ a servant of his own. He had first summoned a goblin imp, which appeared in a yellow guff of brimstone. It was secured to his service, but Nathaniel soon found its ticks and grimaces unendurable and dismissed it from his sight. Next, he had tried a foliate. Although it maintained a discreet appearance, it was compulsively mendacious, trying to twist every one of Nathaniel's commands to its advantage. Nathaniel had been forced to frame even the simplest orders in complex legal language that the creature could not pretend to misconstrue. It was when he found himself taking fifteen minutes to order his servant to run a bath that Nathaniel's patience expired. He blasted the foliate with hot palpitations and banished it for good. Several more attempts followed, with Nathaniel recklessly summoning ever more powerful demons in his search for the ideal slave. He had the necessary energy and skill, but lacked the experience to judge the character of his choices before it was too late. In one of his master's white-bound books, he had located a genie named Castor, last summoned during the Italian Renaissance. It duly appeared, was courteous and efficient, and, Nathaniel was pleased to note, effortlessly more elegant than the ungainly imps of his colleagues in the office. However... Castor possessed a fiery pride. One day, an important social function had been held at the Persian consulate. It was an opportunity for everyone to display their servants, and thus their aptitude. At first, all went well. Castor accompanied Nathaniel at his shoulder in the form of a fat, pink-faced cherub, even going so far as to wear a drape that matched its master's tie. But its coy appearance aroused the distaste of the other imps, which whispered insults as they passed. Castor could not ignore such provocation. In a flash, it bounded from Nathaniel's side, seized a shish kebab from a platter, and, without even pausing to remove the vegetables from the skewer, hurled it like a javelin through the chest of the worst offender. In the ensuing pandemonium, several other imps leaped into the fray. The second plane became awash with whirling limbs, brandished silverware, and contorted, bog-eyed faces. It took the magicians many minutes to regain control. Fortunately, 
Nathaniel had dismissed Castor on the instant, and despite an investigation, it was never satisfactorily resolved which demon had begun the fight. Nathaniel would have dearly liked to punish Castor for its actions, but summoning it again was far too risky. He reverted to less ambitious slaves. However, try as he might, nothing Nathaniel summoned had the combination of initiative, power, and obedience that he required. More than once, in fact, he was surprised to find himself thinking almost wistfully of his first servant. But he had resolved not to summon Bartimaeus again. Whitehall was filled with flocks of excitable commoners straggling down to the river for the evening's naval sail past and firework display. Nathaniel made a face. All afternoon, while he had been hunched at his desk, the sounds of marching bands and happy crowds had filtered through the open window, breaking his concentration. But it was an officially sanctioned nuisance, and he could do nothing about it. On Founder's Day, ordinary people were encouraged to celebrate. The magicians, who were not expected to swallow propaganda so wholeheartedly, worked as usual. All around him were red and shiny faces, happy smiles. The commoners had already enjoyed hours of free eating and drinking at the special stalls set up throughout the capital and had been captivated by the free shows arranged by the Ministry of Entertainment. Every park in central London contained wonders. Stilt walkers, fire eaters from the Punjab, rows of cages, some with exotic beasts, some containing sullen rebels captured in the North American campaigns, piles of treasure collected around the empire, military displays, fates and carousels. A few of the night police were in evidence along the street, although even they were doing their best to fit in with the general frivolity. Nathaniel saw several holding sticks of bright pink candy floss, and one, teeth bared in an unconvincing smile, posing with an elderly lady for her husband's tourist snap. The mood of the crowd seemed relaxed, which was a relief. The events in Piccadilly had not overly agitated them. The bright sun was still high over the sparkling waters of the Thames as Nathaniel crossed Westminster Bridge. He squinted up, through his contact lenses, among the wheeling gulls. He saw the demons hovering, scanning the crowds for possible attack. He bit his lip, kicked savagely at a discarded falafel wrap. It was exactly the kind of day the resistance would choose for one of their little stunts. Maximum publicity. Maximum embarrassment for the government. Was it possible the Piccadilly raid had been one of theirs? No, he couldn't accept it. It was too different from their normal crimes, far more savage and destructive in its scale. And it wasn't the work of humans, whatever the fool Tallow might say. He arrived on the south bank and turned left, away from the crowd, into a restricted residential area. Below the quay, the magician's pleasure yachts lay bobbing unattended, Miss Whitwell's firestorm, the largest and most streamlined of the lot. As he approached the apartment block, the blaring of a horn made him start. Miss Whitwell's limousine was parked against the pavement, its motor ticking. A stolid chauffeur stared out in front. From a rear window, his master's angular head protruded. She beckoned him. At last. I sent an imp, but you'd left already. Get in. We're going to Richmond. The Prime Minister? Wants to see us directly. Hurry up. Nathaniel trotted to the car at speed, heart hammering in his chest. A sudden demand for an audience like this did not bode well. Almost before he'd slammed the door, Miss Whitwell signaled to the chauffeur. The car set off abruptly along the Thames embankment, jerking Nathaniel back in his seat. He composed himself as best he could, aware of his master's eyes upon him. You know what this is about, I suppose, she said dryly. Yes, ma'am. This morning's incident in Piccadilly? 
Naturally. Mr. Devereux wants to know what we are doing about it. Notice I said, we, John. As security minister, I'm responsible for internal affairs, and I will be under some pressure over this. My enemies will seek to gain advantage over me. What will I tell them about this disaster? Have you made any arrests? Nathaniel cleared his throat. No, ma'am. Who is to blame? We are not altogether certain, ma'am. Indeed. I spoke to Mr. Tallow this afternoon. He blamed the resistance quite clearly. Oh, is... Mm, is Mr. Tallow coming to Richmond too, ma'am? He is not. I am bringing you because Mr. Devereux has a liking for you, which may stand in our favor. Mr. Tallow is less presentable. I find him bumptious and incompetent. <laughs> he cannot even be trusted to work a spell correctly, as his skin color attests. She snorted down her pale, thin nose. You are a bright boy, John, she went on. You understand that if the Prime Minister loses patience with me, I will lose patience with those below. Mr. Tallow is consequently a worried man. He trembles as he goes to bed. He knows that worse things than nightmares can come to a man as he sleeps. For the moment, he shields you from the full glare of my displeasure. But do not be complacent. Young as you are, you can be blamed for things quite easily. Already, Mr. Tallow seeks to displace responsibility onto you. Nathaniel said nothing. Miss Whitwell considered him for a while in silence, then turned to glare out at the river, where a flotilla of small naval vessels had begun to pass seawards with much fanfare. Some were ironclads, bound for the far colonies, their wooden hulls encased with metal sheeting. Others were smaller patrol boats designed for European waters, but all had sails unfurled, flags waving. On the banks, crowds cheered, streamers were shot high above to fall into the river like rain. At that time, Mr. Rupert Devereux had been Prime Minister for almost twenty years. He was a magician of secondary abilities, but a consummate politician who had succeeded in remaining in power through his ability to play his colleagues off against each other. Several attempts had been made to overthrow him, but his efficient spy network had succeeded in almost every case ensnaring the conspirators before they struck. Recognizing from the first that his rule depended to some degree on maintaining a lofty detachment from his lesser ministers in London, Mr. Devereux had established his court at Richmond, some ten miles from the heart of the capital. Senior ministers were invited out to consult with him on a weekly basis. Supernatural messengers maintained a constant flow of orders and reports, and so the Prime Minister kept himself informed. Meanwhile, he was able to indulge his inclination towards fine living a habit for which the secluded nature of the Richmond estate was admirably suited. Amongst his other pleasures, Mr. Devereux had developed a passion for the stage. For some years he had cultivated the acquaintance of the leading playwright of the day, Quentin Makepeace, a gentleman of boundless enthusiasm, who regularly attended Richmond to give the Prime Minister private one-man shows. As he grew older and his energies lessened, Mr. Devereux rarely ventured forth from Richmond at all. When he did so, perhaps to review troops departing for the continent, or to attend a first-night theatrical performance, he was accompanied at all times by a bodyguard of ninth-level magicians and a battalion of horlers on the second plane. This caution had become more marked since the days of the Lovelace conspiracy, when Mr. Devereux had very nearly died. His paranoia had grown up like a weed in good muck, twisting and twining itself tightly around all those who served him. None of his ministers could feel entirely secure with either their employment or their lives. 
The gravel road passed through a succession of villages made prosperous by Mr. Devereux's bounty, before ending at Richmond itself. A cluster of well-appointed cottages set about a broad green dotted with oaks and chestnut trees. At one side of the green was a tall brick wall, punctured by a wrought-iron gate that had been reinforced with the usual magical securities. Beyond this, a short drive between rows of box you ended at the red-brick courtyard of Richmond House. The limousine hummed to a standstill before the entrance steps, and four scarlet-coated servants hurried forth in attendance. Although it was still daylight, bright lanterns hung above the porch and shone merrily in several of the tall windows. Somewhere far off, a string quartet played with melancholic elegance. Miss Whitwell did not immediately signal for the car door to be opened. It will be a full council, she said, so I needn't tell you how to behave. No doubt Mr. Duval will be at his most aggressive. He sees last night as a great opportunity to gain a decisive advantage. We must both be suitably composed. Yes, ma'am. Don't let me down, John. She tapped on the window. A servant leaped forward to open the car door. They passed together up shallow sandstone steps and into the foyer of the house. The music was stronger here, drifting lazily among the heavy drapes and eastern furnishings, swelling occasionally, dying back again. The sound seemed quite close, but there was no sign of the musicians. Nathaniel did not expect to see them. On previous occasions when he had visited Richmond, similar music had always been playing. It followed you wherever you went, a permanent backdrop to the beauty of house and grounds. A manservant ushered them through a series of luxurious chambers until they passed under a high white arch and into a long, open, sunlit room, evidently a conservatory appended to the house. On either side stretched brown flower beds, neat and empty and decorous, and studded with ornamental rose bushes. Here and there, invisible persons tilled the earth with rakes. Inside the conservatory, the air was warm, stirred only by a sluggish fan hanging from the ceiling. Below, on a semicircle of low couches and divans, reclined the Prime Minister and his retinue drinking coffee from small white Byzantine cups and listening to the complaints of an immense man in a white suit. Nathaniel's stomach churned to see him there. This was Sholto Pen, whose business had been ruined. I regard it as a most despicable outrage, Mr. Pen was saying. A gross affront! I have sustained such losses! The couch nearest to the door was empty. Miss Whitwell sat here, and Nathaniel, after a hesitation, did likewise. His quick eyes scanned the occupants of the room. First, Pin. Ordinarily, Nathaniel regarded the merchant with suspicion and dislike, since he had been a close friend of the traitor Lovelace. But nothing had ever been proved, and clearly he was the injured party here. His lament rumbled on. That I fear I may never recover. My collection of irreplaceable relics is gone. All I have left is a faience pot containing a useless dried paste. I can scarcely... Rupert Devereux himself lounged on a high-backed couch. He was of average height and build, originally handsome, but now, thanks to his many and varied indulgences, slightly heavier around the jowls and belly. Expressions of boredom and annoyance flitted perpetually across his face, as he listened to Mr. Pin. Mr. Henry Duval, the chief of police, sat nearby, arms folded, his grey cap resting squarely on his knees. He wore the distinctive uniform of the Greybacks, the elite cadre of the night police of which he was commander. A roughed white chemise, a small grey jacket, squared, crisply pressed and decorated with bright red buttons, grey trousers tucked into long black boots, Bright brass epaulets like claws gripped his shoulders. In such an outfit, his hulking frame appeared even bigger and broader than it was. Silent and seated, 
He dominated the room. Three other ministers were present. A bland middle-aged man with lank blonde hair sat studying his nails. This was Carl Mortison of the Home Office. Beside him, yawning ostentatiously, sat Helen Malbindi, the softly spoken information minister, the foreign secretary, Marmaduke Fry, a man of capacious appetites, was not even pretending to listen to Mr. Pin. He was engaged in loudly ordering an extra luncheon from a deferential servant. Six croquette potatoes, green beans, sliced lengthways. For thirty-five years I've built up my supplies. Each one of you has benefited from my experience. And another cod roe omelette with a judicious sprinkling of black pepper. On the same couch as Mr. Devereux, separated from him by a teetering pile of Persian cushions, sat a short red-haired gentleman. He wore an emerald green waistcoat, tight black trousers with sequins sewn into the fabric, and an enormous smile. He appeared to be enjoying the debate hugely. Nathaniel's eyes lingered on him for a moment. Quentin Makepeace was author of more than twenty successful plays, the latest of which, Swans of Araby, had broken box office records across the empire. His presence in the company was somewhat incongruous, but not entirely unexpected. He was known to be the Prime Minister's closest confidant, and the other ministers tolerated him with wary courtesy. Mr. Devereux noted Miss Whitwell's arrival and raised an acknowledging hand. He coughed discreetly. Instantly, Mr. Penn's flows of grievances ceased. Thank you, Sholto, the Prime Minister said. You are most articulate. We are all deeply moved by your predicament. Perhaps now we may get some answers. Jessica Whitwell is here, together with young Mandrake, who I'm sure you all remember. Mr. Duval grunted, his voice heavy with irony. Who does not know the great John Mandrick? We follow his career with interest, particularly his efforts against the troublesome resistance. I hope he brings news of a breakthrough in this case. All eyes fixed upon Nathaniel. He gave a brief, stiff bow as courtesy required. Good evening, sirs, madams. Um... I have no firm news as yet. We have been carefully investigating the scene and... I knew it! The medals on the police chief's chest swung and clicked with the force of his interruption. You hear that, Sholto? No firm news. Hopeless. Mr. Penn regarded Nathaniel through his monocle. Indeed, most disappointing. It is about time internal affairs was taken off this case, Duval continued. We at the police could do a better job. It's time the resistance was crushed. Here, here. Mr. Fry looked up briefly, then returned to the servant. And a strawberry roulade for dessert. It certainly is, Helen Malbindi said gravely. I have myself suffered some losses. A valuable collection of African spirit masks was taken recently. Some of my associates... Carl Mortensen added, were burgled too, and the back room of my Persian carpet supply was set on fire last night. From his corner, Mr. Makepeace smiled equably. In truth, most of these crimes are terribly small scale, are they not? They do not truly hurt us. The resistance are fools. They alienate the commoners with their explosions. People are frightened of them. Small scale? How can you say that? Mr. Duval cried, when one of the most prestigious streets in London has been devastated. Our enemies around the world will be rushing home to communicate the good news. That the British Empire is too weak to prevent attacks on its own doorstep. That'll go down well in the backwoods of America, I can tell you. And on Gladstone's Day, above all. Which is a ridiculous extravagance, incidentally. Mortensen said, a waste of valuable resources. I don't know why we honor the old fool. There was a chuckle from Mr. Makepeace. 
You wouldn't have said that to his face, Mortisin. Gentlemen, gentlemen. The Prime Minister stirred himself. We should not bicker. In one respect, Carl is correct. Founder's Day is a serious business and must be done well. We befuddle the population with gaudy trivialties. Millions are taken from the treasury to finance the free foods and games. Even the Fourth Fleet has delayed embarking for America to provide a little extra spectacle. Anything that spoils the effect and wounds Mr. Pin into the bargain needs to be quickly addressed. Currently, it is the job of internal affairs to investigate crimes of this nature. Now, Jessica, if you would care to report... Miss Whitwell gestured at Nathaniel. Mr. Mandrake has been conducting the case with Mr. Tallow. He has not yet had time to report to me. I suggest we hear him out. The Prime Minister smiled benignly at Nathaniel. Go ahead, John. Nathaniel swallowed. His master was leaving him to fend for himself. Very well, then. It's too early to tell what caused this morning's disruption, he said. Maybe. Sholto Pin's monocle popped out of his eye. Disruption! He roared. This is a catastrophe! How dare you, boy! Nathaniel persevered doggedly. It's too early, sir, he said, to tell whether this was in fact the resistance at all. It might well not be. It might be agents from a foreign power, or the peak of a homegrown renegade. There are odd aspects about the case. Mr. Duval held up a hairy hand. Ridiculous! It's a resistance attack for sure! It has all the hallmarks of their crime. No, sir. Nathaniel forced himself to meet the police chief's gaze. He was not going to kowtow any further. Resistance attacks are small-scale, generally involving low-level magical attacks, molar glasses, elemental spheres. They are always conducted against political targets, against magicians or the businesses which supply us, and have a whiff of opportunism about them. They are always hit and run. The Piccadilly incident was different. It was ferocious in its intensity and was sustained for many minutes. The buildings were wrecked from the inside out, the outer walls remaining largely intact. In short, I believe something was exerting high-level magical control over the destruction. Miss Whitwell spoke then. But there was no evidence of imps or gene. No, ma'am. We methodically combed the area, looked for clues, found nothing. There were no conventional magical traces, which seems to rule out the presence of demons. But nor was there any sign of human involvement. Those persons present during the attack were killed by strong magic of a sort, but we have been unable to identify its source. If I might speak freely, Mr. Tallow is plottingly meticulous, but his methods throw up no new leads. Should our enemy strike again, I believe that we will continue to stumble along in his wake, unless we change our tactics. We need more power to the Greybacks, Mr. Duval said. With respect... Nathaniel said. Six of your wolves were not enough last night. There was a short silence. Mr. Duval's small black eyes appraised Nathaniel up and down. His nose was short, but unusually broad. His chin blue with stubble, protrudent as a snowplow. He said nothing, but the look in his eyes were clear. Well, that is plainly spoken. Mr. Devereux said finally. So what is your suggestion, John? This was it. He had to seize the chance. They were all waiting for him to fail. I think there is every reason to believe last night's assailant will strike again, he said. It has just attacked Piccadilly, one of the most popular tourist destinations in London. Perhaps it seeks to humiliate us, to spread uncertainty among visitors from abroad, to undermine our international standing. Whatever the reason, we need high-level gene on patrol across the capital. I would station them near other prominent shopping areas and tourist sites such as museums and galleries. Then, if anything happens, 
we will be in a position to act fast. There were snorts of disapproval from the assembled ministers and a general outcry. The suggestion was ridiculous. Vigilance spheres were already on patrol. The police were out in force, too. High-level gene required much expenditure of energy. Only the Prime Minister remained quiet, along with Mr. Makepeace, who sat back in his seat, wearing an expression of great merriment. Mr. Devereux called for silence. It seems to me the evidence is inconclusive. Is this outrage the work of the Resistance? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Would more surveillance be useful? Who knows? Well, I have come to a decision. Mandrake, you have proved yourself more than capable in the past. Now do so again. Organize the surveillance and track down the perpetrator. Hunt out the resistance, too. I want results. If internal affairs fails... Here, he eyed Nathaniel and Miss Whitwell meaningfully. We will have to let other departments take over. I suggest you head off now and pick your demons with due care. For the rest of us, it is Founder's Day, and we should be celebrating. Let us go to dinner. Miss Whitwell did not speak until the purring car had left Richmond Village far behind them. You have made an enemy in Duval, she said at last, and I do not think the others care for you much either. But that is now the least of your worries. She looked out at the dark trees, the Russian countryside at dusk. I have faith in you, John, she went on. This idea of yours may bear some fruit. Talk to Tallow. Get your department working. Send out your demons. She ran a long, thin hand through her hair. I cannot concentrate on this problem myself. I have too much to do preparing for the American campaigns. But if you succeed in discovering our enemy, if you bring some pride back to internal affairs, you will be well rewarded. The statement held the implication of its opposite. She left it hanging. She did not need to say the rest. Nathaniel felt impelled to respond. Yes, ma'am, he said huskily. Thank you. Miss Whitwell nodded slowly. She glanced at Nathaniel and, despite his admiration and respect for his master, despite his years living in her house, he suddenly felt that she was eyeing him dispassionately, as if from a great distance. It was the look that an airborne hawk might give a scrawny rabbit while considering whether it was worth the plunge. Nathaniel was suddenly overly conscious of his youth and frailty, of his raw vulnerability beside her power. We do not have much time, his master said. For your sake... I hope you have a competent demon readily to hand.